North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASO was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History video podcast. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. The goal of the NASO podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, and up-and-comers in the field of maritime history. Today, we're heading to Chesapeake Bay in the shores of the Severn River and being joined by B.J. Armstrong. B.J. is a permanent military professor in the History Department of the United States Naval Academy. B.J. Armstrong is this year's recipient of the John Lyman Book Prize in the category of Military and Naval History with his book, Small Boats and Daring Men, Maritime Raiding, Irregular Warfare, and the Early American Navy. Dr. Armstrong is joining us today in his personal and academic capacity, and the opinions expressed are his alone and do not represent the U.S. Naval Academy, the Navy, or any government agency. However, I don't work for the government, so my views are perfectly fine to be expressed by the government and should be adopted by the government. BJ, welcome to the NASO Video and Podcast. Sal, thank you so much for having me aboard. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I am so excited to have you on board for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is you're the very first of our Lyman Book Award winners we're getting on board the video podcast. For those who don't know this, uh, BJ is a member of NASO. I distinctly remember my first interaction, really getting a chance to talk and meet with you was at a NASO conference out in Monterey, as a matter of fact, at the Naval yep. Postgraduate School. And uh, BJ was one of the uh, people who were behind the scenes there, really pushing us to kind of do this video podcast. So the reason we're, we've been doing this and bringing a lot of historians and archaeologists and, and a lot of great young uh, up-and-comers, too, in the field is, is because of uh, some recommendations, and BJ was one of the big ones behind that. But today we're going to talk about your book, which is this year's uh, winner in the military naval history category. So one of the things I, I always like to talk about real quick is, is – why the topic? Why the topic you, you selected? So I was wondering if you could just talk about that very briefly, is why you chose that specific topic to write about. That's a, that's a great question. And, and you're right. It's always kind of an enlightening question for, to get authors to answer. Um, and I'll be honest, this is, this is probably going to uh, frustrate some of my, my fellow academic historians, uh, although others will, will admit to its... Um, genuine nature. Uh, I, I studied this in order to explain my own life to myself. Now, I, I spent 17 years as a Navy helicopter pilot uh, flying search and rescue, combat logistics, and, and special operations missions. Um, my career has largely been a career uh, in the Navy, spent flying missions that were not uh, classical naval battle type missions, right? They're not blue water fleets engaging with each other type stuff. I flew largely uh, in what today we call the expeditionary sea combat community or, or the, the part of the Navy that flies with the Marines. Uh, I provided search and rescue and spec ops support for Marine expeditionary units, um, deployed for OIF-1 uh, for the kind of run to Baghdad portion of the Iraq war in 2003. Um, and, and, you know, in my deployments all over the world, it was never against another Navy. Um, and so, you know, I deployed to the Caribbean where we conducted counter narcotics missions and, and uh, counter smuggling operations. I deployed to the Gulf of Aden where we conducted counter piracy operations. Uh, I, I deployed to the, the Horn of Africa region, different parts of Africa for uh, counter terrorism missions, deployed to uh, the coast of Libya for Operation Odyssey Dawn during the Libyan Civil War. Uh, the same waters that the U.S. Navy sailed in the early 1800s during the Barbary War um, for another civil war that was going on in Libya. Um, and so I, I honestly came to this topic because I wanted to figure out that, I mean, this, this experience didn't mesh, right? The naval history I had learned as a midshipman and a naval officer was about battles. And it was about uh, navies fighting other navies. But it, that largely wasn't what I experienced in the fleet. So was there something else to what navies did? And I, I had some wise advice, uh, some sage counsel from then uh, Director of Naval History and Heritage Command, a, a Navy captain named Jerry Hendricks, 
who was also a naval officer who pursued a PhD while in uniform. Uh, and Jerry's advice to me was, BJ, find a topic where everybody's dead and all their kids are dead and no one's going to come after you. And so I went back as far as I could, right? I went to the early American era because it was going to be safest. I think you succeeded. Uh, in, in that regard, right? And, and so, uh, although I have met disable, uh, descendants of Edward Preble, um, which, was, which was fun. So, but that's really what I did. I went all the way back to the beginning and said, look, is this, is this other stuff that navies do? Some of it combat related, some of it peacetime related. Is there a basis for this? Is there a history for this? And that, that's really what sent me into the archives after this topic. As a historian, I have to, uh, to commend you on, on one particular aspect of the book. I, I thought I found your book to be extremely well readable. I, I, I love the organization of it. I joke all the time when I teach my uh, history majors, you know, you get to write about it, have a good introduction, you have to have good facts in the book, and then you get to have a great conclusion. I think you do that very well in this book. I want to kind of structure our talk along that way. Uh, before we get into that, I want to go into the title of the book, Small Boats and Daring Men, but particularly the subtitle there, uh, Maritime Raiding and Irregular Warfare. So I was wondering if you take a minute and really define those two big terms there, the maritime raiding and the irregular warfare s sections. Yeah, that, and, and frankly, that's one of the, it's one of the difficult parts about this book in a way, um, because irregular warfare is a contemporary term, right? It is, a, it is a late 20th century, 21st century military doctrinal term. Um, and therefore, applying it to the past uh, gets very anachronistic very easily. Right? And, and I admit that in my introduction to the book, that you know, there's an element here of using contemporary phrases that describe uh, military operations and naval operations in a way that maybe they wouldn't have been used in that era. Right? I, I don't think, I certainly never in the archives came across an example of a naval officer in the early American period referring to irregular warfare. Um, actually, frankly to them, I didn't think they saw any of this as irregular. This was their job, this is what they did. Um, but I am, I am an active duty naval officer. And, and so I do in some ways think in contemporary terms. There's also, a, there's a great uh, Journal of Military History article by Ethan Raffuse, and, and I'm gonna forget, I'm gonna butcher the title of it, so I won't even do that, but, it's about the Shenandoah campaign. And he analyzes the Shenandoah campaign in the American Civil War through the lens of a modern military concept of hybrid warfare. And, and he explains at the beginning of the essay that this same challenge that is it, is it anachronistic to use these labels? And as he points out, if we want people to pay attention to our work as scholars, if we want, if we want modern military officers to learn from the history in their past, we have to be able to speak in a language that they're going to read and understand today. And so in some ways, that's why I've adopted that phrase, irregular warfare. For, for me, irregular warfare is used to describe, in, in, in the purposes of this book, irregular warfare is used to describe military operations that are conducted uh, outside of the context of ships fighting ships. And that's a pretty broad spectrum of things, admittedly. You know, in the age of sail period, what we're talking about is cutting out expeditions, small boat raids, um, small craft level uh, missions, but not where they're fighting each other. I'm, I'm often asked, well, what about the Jeffersonian gunboats? You don't really talk about them in the book. And, and largely, that's, that's true. I don't. And largely, it's because the Jeffersonian gunboats were still about ships fighting other ships. Yeah, it was asymmetric. It was, you know, small ships fighting big ships and swarm attacks and, and that kind of thing. But it was still classically naval ships shooting at ships to try and sink them or, or uh, take them out of commission in some way. And so I, I didn't do that. By irregular, I mean the other operations besides the ship-on-ship -ship combat. Now, maritime raiding is, is something that I came to after originally heading down the irregular warfare path. And it, it was largely influenced by the, the work of Jim Bradford um, and, and the realization that, that that is also a good description of some, not all, but some of the kinds of things that I studied in this book. I, I was really interested in the concept that you laid out of the fact that there are really two main schools of thought in, in, in how navies fight you know there's the classics you mentioned the, the fleet on fleet engagement and then there's the commerce rating engagement and, and you're basically using a concept that jim 
Bradford, and Jim is a, is a old hand at NASO, former president of NASO, one of the founding members of NASO. And, and in a study he did on John Paul Jones, comes up with this rating concept. And, and I think you really kind of pull that thread a little further on that. You use eight specific scenarios. You start off with what's depicted in the cover of the book there, John Paul Jones at Whitehaven, his initial raid there. You go through the quasi-war, you go to the Barbary Pirates, you look at the uh, Great Lakes uh, during the War of 1812, really interesting perspective, I thought, that you really looked at there that was unique. Uh, the torpedo campaign of the War of 1812 over to the West Indies and then the two Sumatra campaigns. I remember hearing your talk at Monterey on one of the two Sumatra campaigns. And, and I really want you to kind of talk about that idea of this third style of warfare, because there was a line you had, and I, I looked like throughout the book, because I remember reading it in the book, and I remember it was such a great line you had in there. It was a concept about the idea that, you know, one ship has a global presence, you know, it's like any, any even the smallest Navy can be a global kind of presence. And, and I thought this third style of warfare was such an interesting concept, and, and you distinctly pick a period pre, you know, age of steam, age of iron, you know, we use the age of sail. I know you given that reason because no, no one's alive, but I think it is a useful, you know, it's a useful cutoff point for you to look at and, and work this size. So I thought you'd talk a little more about that concept there of the rating uh, style and this third concept of warfare. Yeah. So the, the, the third idea, right, is like I said, it comes from Jim Bradford. Jim Bradford wrote a, a piece it was published in the Northern Mariner, the, the, the NASO journal with the Canadian Nautical Research Society, um, in which he examined John Paul Jones's correspondence um, and how John Paul Jones thought about naval warfare. Um, so kind of traditionally, we teach naval strategy as these two competing schools, right? There's, there's Guerre de Course, or the War on Commerce. There's Guerre de Scadre, the, the War of the Battle Fleets. And these two sides to the naval strategy coin dominate the way most historians have written about naval strategy and national approaches to navies, but also the way we teach it. Uh, we, I mean, we teach it at the Naval Academy. It, it's taught at, at the Naval War College. Um, and so these two schools, to me, never seemed sufficient. Right? Like I said, they didn't really describe the things that I did out on the world's oceans when I was on deployment as a Navy helicopter pilot. And so I was looking for a, a, an idea, a, a grounding theory, a, a, another way to look at this. And I'll be honest, it was pretty late on in my research. I, I, had, I had moved through most of the collection of archival material for these, uh, for these chapters before I came across uh, Jim Bradford's article. But in Jim's article, he suggests a third way of naval warfare, and he calls it guerre de razia, um, taking that, you know, the French, the French names that are associated with the first two. And he borrows that phrase guerre de razia uh, originally from French colonial officers fighting counterinsurgency campaigns in, in Africa. And, and it's war by raiding. Uh, and it had never really been applied in a maritime context before, and Jim takes this idea of guerre de razia and then examined the papers of John Paul Jones and his writings about, about conflict and naval combat to, to suggest that you know, John Paul Jones thought in this way. He thought there was a third way of naval warfare, that if you were going to conduct naval operations and a naval war, the battle fleet and fighting ship on ship, yeah, that's important. Right? John Paul Jones did that famously on Bonhomme Richard against Serapis, but also is detailed in the book on Ranger against Drake. Also, the war on commerce. Again, John Paul Jones, imminently famous. In fact, that's where he made his name at first in the American public's recognition of him was in his commands aboard Providence and Alfred and raiding the Grand Banks and, and Canadian fisheries and, and shipping uh, during the American Revolution. He made, made a decent amount of money off those prizes as well. So he did both of those, but he thought there was something more. Um, and Jim's, uh, his article is really fascinating. Like I said, it goes right into Paul Jones's correspondence, what he said about naval warfare, and what he thought about naval warfare. And I read that article and said, okay, there it is. There's, there's the central idea um, that most of my other chapters actually revolve around how, if this idea of Gerda Razia is real, if it exists, then it would have historical roots. Right? The theory would have historical roots, and we could study the history to prove it, to disprove it. And likewise, it would show us norms of, of how Gerda Razi is conducted. We could, we could potentially find patterns to say these are the things to think about in Gerda Razia. Uh, 
in the war by rating. Uh, and so in going and writing the chapters from the research, as I wrote them and as I analyzed the history involved, that's how the, the threads between the chapters and from the introduction through into the conclusion all kind of came together. Um, and, and I've, like I said, I, I owe a great deal to Jim and that, that kernel of an idea because really what the book ends up doing is setting about to prove that the idea is right. That in the early American uh, period, in the early American US Navy, there, the, the, the war on commerce and the battle fleet was not the only type of naval operation that officers thought about and that leaders pursued. That there was also this third element of naval warfare, the war by raiding, uh, that was a fundamental part of how they thought about their job. Well, and I think that's the difference that differentiates your work for some just, you know, here's a book on early American naval history that just kind of recounts these eight events. I mean, it, it, there's a philosophical and a historical basis that you're arguing that, that, that really is, is eminent throughout the book. I mean, you, you just feel that thread throughout the book as you go through and, and you hit on several kind of key points throughout the eight uh, events. And I just want to talk about a couple of them because I think, you know, I want to talk about the eight events individually, but some of the, I think the themes are really important. So one of the things you talk about is leadership. Obviously leadership is always a big issue. Some, some commanders are good at this. Some are not going to be good at this. And, and you highlight some, some names that are familiar to people with in, in early American naval history and some that are probably not so familiar. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of that leadership elements you have there, the ones that, as you said, quote unquote, had good sense. Yeah, yeah and that was, that was taken from uh, Stoddart, the very first Secretary of the Navy, right? He was looking for uh, officers with, junior officers with good sense. Um, so the, the themes that, are, that kind of are pulled throughout the book, um, leadership is one of, the, one of these big ones in, in, in terms of like approaches to leadership and the things you think about when leading. But I, I want to admit that, you know, and I hope the book does a good job of showing this, that in each of these episodes that are studied in the chapters, you know, the, the themes are demonstrated in different ways, right? This isn't a checklist. There's no math equation here that says this is how you shall succeed. Because in each of these cases, leadership is illustrated in a slightly different way. And yeah, we can make observations based on looking at that over and over and over again. Um, but by no means is this prescriptive. Uh, and, and I just want to get that on the table first. My conclusions are not meant to be prescriptive. They're meant more to offer us things to think about, questions to ask when we examine other cases of maritime rating or irregular warfare. Hey, what does this show about leadership? Or, you know, we'll talk about some of the others later, like partnership or, or the value of small combatants. Um, what does this examples show about that because not all of the eight chapters really show exactly the same thing the same themes same big picture issues but they're handled in different ways in the specifics and in the details um, but this leadership thing is is an important one I, what i found was time and time again similar names keep popping up um, it, it's either the same people or it's kind of generations of mentorship in terms of the people involved in these eight cases. And the cases start with John Paul Jones and the American Revolution, and they range all the way up to the, the late 1830s with the second uh, Sumatran expedition. Right? So we're talking about you know, roughly 40, 50 years of, of history here, so more than one generation of naval officers. And what we find is, is same names popping up over and over again. And it suggests, and as we see that develop throughout the chapters, what it suggests to me is, that those who develop experience with irregular operations when they're young, early on in their careers, are more likely to encourage it and to see it as a value added to the naval war, or to a naval conflict later on in their careers. Now, Stephen Decatur is probably the most famous example and, and the easiest and most recognizable to people, right? Stephen Decatur begins his career in the quasi-war. Not really a whole lot of, uh, of honor and glory for Stephen Decatur in the Quasi-War. He serves on United States under John Barry, and Barry, and Barry has a good Quasi-War, but, but he's not the hero that Truxton is or one of the other victors of major battles in the Quasi-War. But really, Decatur makes his name in the Barbary War, right? The attack on Tripoli Harbor to burn the Philadelphia on board Intrepid um, is, is a, well, I mean, it's one of those moments in American naval history that, that is, taught even in other places besides the United States of America, right? 
And so Decatur has this experience with raiding and small unit attacks, irregular operations when he's young, when he's a junior officer. Now he's promoted to captain uh, rapidly by Congress because of it. Um, so he becomes a senior officer very fast after the fact. But he has these experiences where he sees the value of it. He sees how it can affect the balance of power within a conflict. He sees how a small irregular operation can have larger strategic effects. So by the time we reach the War of 1812, and Decatur is a senior Commodore and one of the senior officers in the Navy, once he's bottled up in New London uh, in the British block, after the British blockade, he becomes a huge supporter of irregular operations, and in particular, the attempted torpedo attacks in Long Island Sound and in the vicinity of New York. Um, other officers like John Rogers, who does not have much experience with irregular operations as, as a junior officer, he's focused more on the ships fighting other ships part of this job. Rogers doesn't like irregular operations. And again, it's demonstrated in the War of 1812 when, as he takes over the defenses of Baltimore uh, at the end of the war, as the British make the, the attack on the assault on Baltimore and, and Fort McHenry and the bombs bursting in air, um, you know, Rogers commands the naval elements of that. And he is offered torpedoes or mines to use against the British ships. And he turns Robert Fulton down and he, because he doesn't feel like that's necessary or a part of naval warfare. So whereas Decatur is supporting those kinds of operations, trying to help them, trying to give them guidance and intelligence and material support, Rogers is turning them down because he doesn't see them as part of naval warfare. So this idea that there's different leadership experiences that lead to effective use of Gerdorazia kind of weaves its way throughout. And like I said, we see this almost in a, in a generational sort of way. Another one of those officers who engages in um, maritime irregular warfare in this era is David Porter. David Porter in the Quasi War, uh, David Porter initially in the Barbary Boar before he is taken captive on the Philadelphia and spends the rest of the war in a POW uh, camp. Um, but David Porter really embraces irregular operations and the wide swath of, of the potential uses of a Navy. And we see this during his leadership of the West Indies Squadron particularly in the 1820s, after the War of 1812. Um, so Porter develops all of these skills and all of these talents and all of this, this thought on irregular operations. Um, but the officer that leads the first Sumatran expedition is John Downs. Where did John Downs figure out how to do raiding operations and how to conduct the raids on Kuala Batu in the, in, on the coast of Sumatra? Well, it turns out he was Porter's first lieutenant on Essex during the War of 1812. Right? Essex, which conducted operations in the South Pacific, and, and really Porter is one of Downs' mentors. Downs learns what he knows about Gerdorazia from David Porter. Because there's no Naval Academy, because there's no doctrinal teaching, because there's no formal a thing to teach naval officers in this era. It's all largely mentorship based in terms of how they learn their craft, how they learn the professional responsibilities of an officer. And so we see individuals that show this leadership thing, but we also saw, we also see them passing it on to new generations. Um, what does it mean to have a different, uh, uh, an irregular warfare view of leadership? Well, it's an acknowledgement that diplomacy matters, that it's not just the combat. It's an acknowledgement that economics often matters. Um, for example, in the Sumatran expeditions, the, the ability to cut off Sumatran pepper traders from the Europeans and Americans that were coming to try and buy their product has an important influence on the interactions between the Americans and the locals. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole element there at the senior officer level where it's a broader view of naval responsibilities in the naval world. I, I just want to take a minute on, on that too, BJ, because I, I think you're hitting on such a couple of great points right here that kind of open up even some more discussion on it. So David Porter is, is for me, I, I, I always tell you, is, is probably one of my favorites. I just, I just love what he does at the West Indies Squadron. He, he's in everything. He's controversial. He, he is not the clean cut decator. He, he's, he's anything but in many ways. 
but but the Wesley Squadron is, is is so amazing to me because you have a couple of things going on. It's post War of eighteen twelve. You got the Navy Act of eighteen sixteen that are building frigates and ships of the line. Yet what the Navy starts producing in in, in larger numbers and more actually producing them is is schooners and 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 sloops of war. Porter comes in, changes the makeup of the West Indies Squadron to something more manageable, more useful down there. And, and it really hits on two of the points that you use in the book. One was talking about technology, obviously, the, the, the different elements of technology. He has the Seagull, which is a steam-powered vessel with him. But he's using smaller vessels, using junior officers, which I think is such a key thing. One of the things that I, I noticed throughout the book is, is how important it was to get junior officers some command experience, you know, go all beyond the horizon and be on your own, something that I think is lacking today in some ways, but it's a whole different subject. And then that relationship issue you talked about too, working with uh, other nations and combined operations and, 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 and elements. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those two elements, the technology side and then that relationship aspect uh, as it plays out in the book. Yeah, I, I made an effort, and you pointed this out earlier when you mentioned, you know, kind of bounding myself within the age of sale period. I made an effort, part of the reason for the age of sale is, is to eliminate technology. Right. Technology is a huge driver in, in naval history. Right? There's no way around it. The, the changes of weapons, changes of ship design, they influence the character of naval war in enormous ways. And so I wanted to try and avoid that as much as possible because I didn't, I didn't want to be chasing technological changes uh, through my examinations of this concept. I wanted to try and bound things so I could have a, have a group of, of examples that I could study that were comparable, apples to apples. So that's, in essence, that's why I stopped in, in 1839 with the second Sumatra expedition, because in 1840 is when the first steam sloops begin to be purchased for the U.S. Navy, and, and the, the, the character of the fleet starts to change. Now, having attempted to do that, I couldn't avoid technology entirely. Right? And so the two examples that are the most kind of glaring in the in the book are the chapter on torpedoes in the War of 1812. Uh, most folks don't realize that the first American experience with mine warfare was actually in the War of 1812. And that uh, going back through the archives, I've documented over a dozen examples of attempted attacks on British warships using mine warfare and undersea warfare based on the ideas and the technologies of Robert Fulton. It's really, it's a, it's a lesser, people have studied elements of this. They've, they've shown some of these that happen in the Chesapeake or some of these that happen in, in Long Island Sound. Um, but I think that this book is, in the chapter in the book about it, is the first examination of the, the totality of the attempt to use undersea warfare in the War of 1812. So I couldn't avoid technology there, right? And, and as you mentioned, in the counter piracy campaign in the Caribbean in the 1820s, that's actually the first combat use of a steam vessel in the United States Navy. People like to credit the Fulton or the Demologos, which is built at the War of 1812 as the first steam vessel in the US Navy, it is. But Demologos never leaves New York Harbor and it never engages in combat. It, it, it actually is hardly even used for any operations. It becomes a receiving ship very quickly after its commission. And, and likewise, then we jump ahead to the 1840s and we say, well, there, look, there wasn't, there wasn't any steam stuff going on in between. Well, that's not true. The Seagull deployed to the Caribbean in the 1820s to fight piracy and, and was involved in combat operations. And it was really, it was a converted ferry boat. It was a, a ferry boat named Enterprise that the Navy purchased from some folks running a ferry in Connecticut that they uh, rechristened the, the Seagull because there was already an Enterprise. And they put a couple guns on it and strapped some boats to it and loaded it full of sailors and Marines and headed it off hunting pirates. And it's, a, it's kind of a fascinating example of, of technology because it's in a micro scale. Usually when we talk technology in the Navy, we talk in a macro scale. We're talking about fleet design. We're talking about large classes, building new ships, right? Big technology ideas. This is a single ship. Uh, and seeing how they used it, how they adapted to it, how it made some of their life harder, some of their life easier, it kind of this micro level is really kind of really kind of interesting to see. So yeah, the technologies that are introduced, despite my efforts to keep them out of the work, uh, the technologies that are introduced do suggest that, look, new technology and the adoption of innovative new technologies 
is also a part of maritime irregular warfare. It's not just a question for the big fleet battle. Uh, now it's different because like I said, it's at, the, it's at the micro level, not the macro level. And so a few small purchases of technologies can go a long way to influencing irregular operations. Whereas if you want to influence you know, the war of battle fleets at a technological level, you're talking about changing the entirety of fleets, the, the, the whole makeup of a force design. And you're not talking about that when you're talking about Gerdorazia. You, you can talk about one ship making a fundamental difference or one handful of mines uh, making a fundamental difference in how people think about naval combat. And so technology takes on kind of a different character in this, in this example. The other technology element uh, that, that you mentioned just a moment ago is the, the size of the combatants. Um, time and time again in these chapters, what we see is small combatants. And by small combatants, I mean, you know, uh, schooners and brigs and smaller, tenders. Um, really, you're, you're talking boats as much as ships. We see them time and time again being fundamental uh, to the efforts. I think of I think of the Polly Hopkins uh, the in the first Sumatran campaign in 1832 they they take one of their whale boats and they rig it up as a gunboat they put a howitzer on it um, they they man it with swivels uh, they make this little baby gunboat that that sails off the shore of Kuala Batu to fire to offer fire support to the Marines and sailors who have landed to assault the village uh, and and it makes a, a important contribution to that attack on the village. And it, it was cobbled together from stuff they had on board the frigate because they needed it and, and they figured out how to make it work. And so time and time again, we see these examples of small combatants and gunboats being important to the irregular campaigns, to the maritime raiding campaigns. But oftentimes those ships of small size and stature, usually commanded by junior officers, as you pointed out, so not prestigious, not glorious, they oftentimes are the thing that we forget about when looking at fleet design. And the U.S. Navy has traditionally kind of used them and then retired them and focused on building the big battle fleet ships. Whether those are ships of the line, whether those are frigates in the age of sail context, or whether you know we get to the late 19th century and we start talking about battleships, oftentimes we're more focused when we talk about our naval past on the capital ships. And, and the navies ignore might be too strong a word, but they downplay the importance of small combatants in terms of fleet design. When these examples all show that they, they're kind of crucial to being out on the world's oceans. I, I think you make a great point on that because, again, I, I think that the focus in, especially when you see that development of how the players who are junior in, in a previous incident are now moving up and, and the ones who have learned from that previous incident are now thrust into a position of command or oversight. And, and, and you see it with Porter, with Downs, as you mentioned earlier before, you see them moving up and they've got that backdrop. Again, we don't have that formal education system during this period of time that we get much later. And so you have to learn kind of on the fly and with hands-on experience. And we definitely see that as you progress from, you know, you have an incident that starts during the American Revolution and your last one's in the 1840s with the, with the Sumatra incident here, I believe. is And so you see that progression happen. The other element we, other element we were talking about was that relationship between naval forces and outside entities. Uh, this, is, this is a Navy that's operating on the far peripheries of its abilities, you know, as, as you mentioned before, you know, you can get in your ship, sail over there and you have a global presence. And now you're in the far East, you're in the Mediterranean, you're in the Caribbean, which in many ways is far away in the other side of the planet uh, for a sailing ship as, as, as anything else. And you have to build certain elements with those foreign relationships. I think are so critical to understanding how you conduct irregular warfare and maritime raiding. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it, that's one of those kind of big themes that stretches through multiple of these examples. When we think about alliances or partnerships, you know, partnerships is another one of those anachronistic kind of modern 21st century labels. We think about partnerships and alliances. We talk about them in naval strategy and in naval context. We often mean at the, at the battle fleet level, right? The, the you know Battle of Trafalgar, you had the French and the Spanish in a combined fleet with an alliance uh, and how they worked together or in some cases did not work together all that well and the combat effect of that um, 
are an important part of the history that we've all studied as naval historians. But I think that that idea of partnership, again, taking it from that macro level and instead looking at a micro level in these examples of irregular warfare and maritime raiding campaigns, partnership again raises its head, but it's a different view of partnership. It, it's individual relationships. It's a uh, partnership for intelligence gathering, for diplomatic effect, for economic effect, as much as it is for combat effect. A couple of examples that kind of stick out in my mind. Honestly, the chapter number one, there, there we have John Paul Jones on the cover, right? Why does John Paul Jones raid Whitehaven? It's because it's his hometown. He knows the harbor at Whitehaven like the back of his hand. He grew up sailing that harbor. He doesn't need extra intelligence or information. Even though he doesn't need it, they still have a group of, uh, of Irish fishermen who the ranger picks up during their uh, time in the Irish Sea raiding British shipping, who give them a great deal of solid uh, intelligence on the disposition of the Royal Navy and the different kind of merchant traffic in the Irish Sea. So even in that case, John Paul Jones gets a local partner, might be the wrong way to put those fellows because they're being held. Uh, against their will aboard Ranger, but they cooperate pretty easily because, you know, they're Irish and it's about attacking the English. So um, they kind of cooperate, they, they smile as they give the information. But John Paul Jones attacks Whitehaven because it's his hometown. He, he doesn't meet, he knows exactly where the hazards are going into that harbor and exactly how to lay out his forces when they attack the different, out the north side and the south side and where the fort is and where the guns are. He knows it all. Um, in most of the cases, we don't have that example, right, of a, of a native being the leader of the expedition. But we see it time and time again that, that naval officers need that kind of information. And how do you get that kind of information? It's by developing relationships with locals. In the case of the, that Sumatran expedition in 32 and also the one in 39, there is a, there is a local Sumatran. Uh, the Americans call him Poe Adam. That's the name that, that is given in the in the sources, who works for and with the Americans. He had worked with American pepper traders and merchant traders uh, prior to the attack on the Friendship, which is the, the American pepper trading merchant that is attacked by pirates that instigates the first of these evolutions. But he had worked with Americans economically for, for quite a few years, and he ends up providing key kind of diplomatic and local knowledge to both John Downs in 32, but also seven years later when George Reed shows up with the East India Squadron, Poe Adam is there again, you know, comes out in his canoe to, to join up with the Americans and provide them the knowledge they need. Now, is he doing it out of the goodness of his heart? Not entirely, right? He has certain political objectives that he wants to uh, achieve on shore. And working with the Americans helps him achieve some of those things, raising his status, perhaps, raising his economic fortunes, perhaps. Um, so different motivations are involved here, but that relationship is fundamental to how those two Sumatran expeditions are conducted. And we see it again in, in the West Indies counter piracy campaign, the cooperation between the Americans and the Spanish authorities in Cuba and Puerto Rico, sometimes cooperation, sometimes the antagonism between them has direct impacts operationally on what it is the US Navy is trying to achieve in the fight against pirates in the 1820s. And so there's this diplomatic element, there's this partnership element that is fundamental to Guerre de Razia. It's also fundamental to, to battle fleets working together or against each other, but it's, it's different because then you're talking about at a national level. And in the examples we see in the book, it's not always at the, the national level, it's often relationships at a local level or smaller. And, and you, you great have some great examples in there. Again, you, you were talking about I always I always am, am struck by uh, Salvatore Catalano, who's the pilot who helps uh, uh, Decatur uh, coming in the Tripoli. And I think it's the name that always catches me for some strange reason. But but I, I think, you know, again, this is a point in in I think it's so great to look at this because it's a point when the US Navy doesn't have a, a huge infrastructure. It's not a global force. And so it really relies on those 
partnerships with with nations to do it you know getting the gunboats from the kingdom of the two sicilies you know to, to fill in for the attack on tripoli and, and just logistics bases and support and and, and and you know i'm always amazed by the fact that one minute the u.s and the british are killing each other in the war of 1812 then immediately you know they open gibraltar up for the american squadron going to go attack algeria it, it's amazing how that flips around so quickly I, and, I it's talk, not, and it's not just foreign, it's not just foreign partnerships either, right? It's a, partnerships within the American context as well. It's relationships between naval officers and State Department representatives, diplomats around the world, which is really important. You know, the Barbary Wars are a great example of that. Uh, but likewise with the merchant fleet. But time and time again in these examples, the U.S. Navy receives good, uh, sometimes not good, but inaccurate, uh, but oftentimes very good and useful and helpful information from American merchant sailors and merchant captains who are out on the world's oceans who are passing that information. In that first Sumatran expedition, a, a great example is, is, uh, is Barry, who is the second mate on the friendship, the pepper trader that is attacked, that instigates this. When the friendship makes it back to the United States before Potomac sails to go to Sumatra to, to chastise the pirates, Barry is made a sailing master. You know, stroke of a pen by the SECNAV, because that's all it took for a warrant officer at that point. Barry's made a sailing master, and he's put on Potomac to help guide the ship to the right place in Sumatra, because he had local knowledge of the village as well. He was going to help out. And that those relationships between the U.S. merchant fleet and the U.S. Navy are also really important partnerships in this context. And a lot of these officers had served as merchant officers. A lot of them got that background doing that. And, and a lot of that, I think you're right. I, I think that's a, a period of time. I always talk about this idea that, that the Navy and the Merchant Marine were much more uh, symbiotic during this period of time than, than later due to technology and other issues. So one of, the, one of the comments you have in here, which, which again, goes back to what we're just talking about is naval irregular warfare is not quite so irregular. And I, I think that's, that's the big theme I, I get out of this is like, this, this is more the norm than anything else is, is to be ready to do this kind of jack of all trade hey we're not exactly sure what type of warfare we're doing but you know the fleet action that's the rarity it, it's this is the norm that we should get ready for and and in your conclusion you you uh, quote jeff jeffrey till and, and anyone who does anything in, in in naval history needs to you know you know alt, you know worship at the altar of jeffrey till uh it, and you know his sea power uh his guide to the 21st century he talks about this idea of modern postmodern navies and and so you know Obviously, the United States is is the definition of a modern navy. It, you know, it's the ballistic missile submarines, it's the fleet carriers, it, it, it's getting ready for that peer to peer type confrontation. But in many ways, you you identify that during the the period of age of sail that you study, the navy is much more postmodern. We, we are the almost a textbook definition of a postmodern. And, and and I'm wondering what kind of lessons can be extrapolated from your study of of the navy during the period of age of sail, maybe to to, to the modern day in some ways. Yeah, I think in many ways, Till's, uh, Till's building of that dichotomy in, in his Sea Power uh, book is a 20th century view of the world uh, and a view, 20th century view of naval history, that there's a modern period and a postmodern period that opens up at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st. Um, and I, I admit, I kind of take him to task a little bit for that because I feel like many of the things that he identifies as postmodern that he identifies as kind of uniquely early 21st century views of, of naval conflict, things like the importance of the littorals, things like uh, the importance of expeditionary operations as opposed to big battle fleets, uh, stuff like that. Th these are all woven into the, the chapters that I studied about the early American Navy. And so, you know, the early American Navy fits all, almost all of his categories of what a postmodern Navy is. So, so does that really stand up then as a, as a label? Um, and I wonder, I, I, now I've been asked this a number of times, you know, project this across American history, and, and I haven't studied hard enough to do that, right? Like I, I got into the archives and I wrote this book about the early American era. I, I don't have a companion volume about the Civil War and a companion volume about the late 19th century yet. Yeah, maybe someday I'll, I'll work on that. Um, but so I can really only declaratively speak about this era and, and say that, you know, it, it is, there's something here. This is how naval officers thought about their job. It's how Marine Corps officers thought about their job in this early American context. 
Um, now, does that project further? I suspect that it does. My knowledge of later American naval history, you know, when you think about examples like the Navy and Marine Corps' involvement in the Philippine insurrection following the War of 1898, uh, a, a largely unstudied part of our naval past. Yeah, they were the gunboats, destroyers, lots of operations around the Philippines supporting the Army and the Marine Corps during that time. If you think about the gunboats on the, the China and Yangtze patrols in the 1820s, uh, if you think about Operation Game Warden, uh, if you think about the Riverine campaigns in Vietnam, all of these things resonate with the ideas that are in my book, Small Boats and Daring Men. And so I would suspect when, when studied in deeper detail and with more depth, that we would start to find that this is a very common part of our American naval past. And that would also suggest that it's something that the Navy might want to think about in, in the present moment, in our contemporary world in the 21st century. Well, I will say, go ahead. Go ahead. I no, was going to say one of the, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the most rewarding parts of the reception of this book is the way that uh, certain uh, junior members and, and mid-career members of the U.S. Marine Corps have really latched onto the book. Um, there are many Marines that I have talked to who read this book and told me that they, they feel like this book offers the historical roots of the, the transformation the Marine Corps is going through right now with, with Commandant Berger's new Commandant Planning Guidance and his new Force Design Memo uh, discussing a move back towards maritime rating as a fundamental part of the Marine Corps' mission, uh, maybe at the expense of big, large amphibious assaults. Uh, and so the Marines have really taken to this book. I, I mean, there've been, there've been two or three articles at the Marine Corps Gazette and other places saying, if you wanna understand the new direction of the Marine Corps, read something about the old stuff, go read Small Boats and Daring Men. And that, that's incredibly rewarding to see. No, I, I was going to mention that, you know, the, the reception you receive from the military side, particularly the Marine Corps, as you mentioned, it has, has been absolutely phenomenal. I, I got to say, as I was reading this and, and looking at it, you know, I popped my head into 2009 and, and the takedown of Maersk, Alabama, and, and, and how that kind of, you know, the, the one time Bainbridge ever defeats a pirate is, is in 2009. And, 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 and we, we see very much what you talked about here being enacted there. And yeah, you do have special forces involved, but still it, it was very much this kind of ad hoc, you know, let, let's go ahead and, and deal with a, a situation and really thrust a lot of, you know, decision-making onto those local commanders and uh, in the field, even though we, we had technology that talks about it. I, I do want to kind of change course here just a little bit, because you didn't mention about getting into the archives because, you know, you have an award-winning book now. And I think one of the things that we want these uh, uh, videos and these, these podcasts to do is kind of talk to historians and those who are doing research is, you know, I, how do you tackle a, a situation like this? So let's, let's talk a little bit about the research side about this. What did you do for the research? You know, you're talking about a topic that was a very, you know, time-constrained period. You're looking age of sale. So obviously, you, you're talking about getting into archives and records, but what was the process that you undertook to really get the facts behind this uh, material? Well, you know, other than, than following kind of your, your traditional historical process of starting with the secondary literature and then, you know, after you've read it, look at the footnotes and say, oh, where do you get that from? Chasing that down and, and that kind of thing. Archivally, I worked uh, largely you know, I, I would have to say if, if the one biggest source was the record group 45, the U.S. Navy's records um, from this era at, at the National Archives. Largely on, mic it's almost entirely on microfilm, um, but all of the SECNAV's records really from this era, and we have to remember this era, the SECNAV is also the CNO, right? The SECNAV is the operational commander as well as the administrative leader of the Navy. And so all of SECNAV's records contain the correspondence and the reports involved in, in all of these or most of these operations. But branching out from there, it was also important as best I could to find the sources from potential opponents. And that led me to the British National Archives at Kew to do a lot of work in the Admiralty files, uh, as well as the Canadian uh, uh, Library and Archives, where a, a great deal of or some of the material for the chapter on the the Great Lakes in the War of 1812 came from. And so I was able to chase down a lot of the, the British source material on that side from those. And then in addition to that, then you start looking for uh, uh, personal correspondence, you start looking for uh, published 
uh, journals and diaries. In, in, the, in the cases of the Sumatran expeditions, there are um, schoolmasters on board the ships in 32 and 39 who write books and come back and publish books about the, the deployment they were on, which included the operations off of Sumatra. And so those are fascinating sources to show you kind of an outsider's view a little bit, uh, not a naval officer's view, but, but someone who was hired to come teach the midshipmen who happened to be there and have a little bit of time to keep a diary. Uh, and so you get to see a really interesting view of, of the operations and how they're conducted and why they're conducted and what the leaders said about them and that kind of thing in those, in those memoirs. So the sources were kind of were, were spread across primarily those areas when it came to, to primary sources. When it comes to secondary sources, I had, to, I had to cobble a lot of things together, a lot of reliance on biography, right? There have been some very good biographies written about, about figures from the early American Navy. Uh, and so that, that's enormously helpful. But in terms of the idea of studying irregular operations, uh, there's not a whole lot of literature out there to fall back on. Uh, as a starting point. And so that my, my hope is that my book will help contribute to that in the future. Well, I always think one of the biggest hurdles that we face as historians is, is not to write about the history, but to write about something that is sig not significant, but, but has a so what answer to it, which is always the, the toughest element. And, and if, I, if I remember correctly, going back through when, when you wrote this, this was part of your doctoral dissertation. This is basically the, the element of your dissertation. So that, that creates a very unique relationship between you and your dissertation advisor. So uh, you did yours at, at King's, I believe, right? Uh, and, yeah, and so, so I, I studied with Andrew Lambert at King's College London. And, and yeah, the, the, the project began as the doctoral thesis um, and, then, and then blew up when I went into book writing mode, right? Like as, as many or most of us do, it's not, it's not the thesis. It's a it's an entirely different introduction and an entirely different conclusion and additional chapters and rewrites and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but yeah, it's uh, it and I was lucky in a way, um, in that you know Andrew Lambert is my supervisor. He very much uh, kind of encouraged me, allowed me to think of it as a book, uh, to not think of it as an academic document, as a dissertation but to think of it as a first draft of a book that, that would need rework, that would need changed and built upon, um, but to consider it in that way. And so I was enormously lucky in that regard because the bones were largely there um, when it came time to, to develop a manuscript. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was a, a really great experience studying in the United Kingdom with a British naval historian. Uh, I do remember uh, in the British system of, of the PhD, there's uh, kind of the equivalent of defending your research proposal is, is what they call the mini viva, which happens about a year or so into the process. And you take a chapter, uh, usually it's your introduction or your first chapter. You take a chapter and you have to defend it. And you have to prove to the, to the panel that you've got, you've got something there, that you can actually build an entire dissertation around this thing. Um, and the, the chapter I actually took was the torpedo chapter on the War of 1812. And I do remember um, Alessio Padalato, uh, a professor at King's, was on that, that panel. And so the, the examiners for my mini viva were a British naval historian, a Canadian naval historian, and an Italian naval historian. And I'm an American. And of course, what does the Italian ask? Right? Alessio ends the defense by asking, so BJ, who won the War of 1812? That's a good way to throw the hand grenade <laughs> into the meeting right, right there uh, yeah, between exactly. those three. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although I have to tell you, Alessio shares your love of Salvatore Catalano. Well, that's As good. As a fellow yeah. Neapolitan, he, he finds him delightful. Let, let me ask you one more question on that, BJ, because I'm, I'm interested in this too. You know, I, I went through grad school as a civilian, and so it's a little different. You were a serving naval officer at the time that, that you did yours. And, and uh, I'm interested in that experience you had, uh, being a naval officer, going through the program. There's differences, obviously, you know, you, in terms of, of structure and, 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 and means, but, but how, how did that come across for you being a serving naval officer? So I was lucky. I, I started my PhD with Kings pretty much on my own. Um, the Navy, I was not in a Navy program. The Navy was not paying or supporting uh, the effort uh, really uh, in a formal way. I did have some really great bosses though, right? I had, I had skippers uh, and, and bosses in the Pentagon who were enormously supportive of my efforts and were willing to help me work my schedule so that I could do things like go to London for two weeks and spend a week in the British archives, 
uh, and, and make research trips and do stuff like that. And so I was incredibly lucky at a personal level that I just had, you know, immediate supervisors who were, who were super supportive and super helpful and helped me find the time to take leave, to be able to, to, to do what I needed to do to continue this process while working kind of my job in the Navy and being a good Naval officer. So that was, that was certainly kind of a challenge. And I knew going in that that was potentially going to be uh, a difficulty. Now, I, I also got lucky in that the Navy selected me for the permanent military professor program at the academy. I was, I'd finished that upgrade defense. I was in the, the kind of writing up portion of the PhD. But basically, the last year of writing my dissertation, uh, I, was, I was relieved of any other Navy responsibilities. And I was able to hide myself in Nimitz Library and just work on the dissertation which was amazing. Um, I got to actually feel like I was having an academic experience instead of part-timing it. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was and, and oh, by the way, you know, there is no better place in the world to research and write American naval history than sitting in Nimitz Library, right? Every book I could possibly need was steps away. Um, I, I will echo that. I've done, I believe me not, I've, I've driven up back in the day when you get on the yard a lot easier and, and I would I'd just go up for a few days and just plant myself in Nimitz. It was so easy to just be able to grab everything off the shelves and, 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 and a great staff there too. I always compliment the Nimitz uh, staff. If there's nothing there. If you, if you can't get it, they'll get it for you. And, and uh, they've sure. been extremely great in the long term. Well, I want to thank BJ Armstrong for taking the time to talk with us today. I, I think BJ, you've written a, a great book. I was so glad that we were able to use you to first to kind of highlight our, our Lyman Book Awards for this year. We're going to have uh, other Lyman uh, recipients come in and, and talk about their books, but it's been definitely great to have you on. I will also highlight BJ for one other thing. Uh, besides being at the Naval Academy uh, this past year in 2019, uh, BJ oversaw the McMullen Naval History Symposium. Uh, and, and for those of you who are interested in military and naval history particularly, uh, the McMullen Naval History Symposium every two years up at the U.S. Naval Academy is the must place to be. Next to NASO, it's, it's a great place to be and, and uh, absolutely just a fantastic bringing together of, of people, of, of ideas. It, it's just, just phenomenal. And I want to compliment you on last year's. So it was great. I was so happy. I'm, I'm looking, I always look forward to it. It's on every odd year. So looking forward to 2021 being back up on the yard and, and, and being there for it. Uh, uh, I know you'll be you, happy because you. you'll be able to turn it over to somebody else hopefully at this point. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah, we're, we're incredibly proud of McMullen at the Naval Academy. We, we do genuinely feel like it, it can be kind of the center of the, the Naval and Maritime historical world every other year. Uh, and, and in fact, in 2019, it was the largest conference we've ever had with over 400 registrants. It was, it was very, very big and, and went incredibly well because, because we bring in so many great scholars. I think, I think part of it is because we have such a big tent. You know, we, we broadly define maritime and naval history. Really, if you're, if you're doing good scholarship remotely related, then you've got a shot at getting on one of the panels. And because of that, such a wide breadth of scholarship that really it, it's a fascinating opportunity for us as scholars, uh, for us as teachers, because our midshipmen will often go to the panels and learn about interesting things that they wouldn't otherwise see in the classroom. And like you pointed out, I am really delighted uh, for, for McMullen 2021. You'll probably see the call for papers sometime towards the end of November. Uh, and I am especially delighted because uh, Dr. Ginny Lunsford will be the director this year instead of me. Uh, supported by Commander Stan Fisher as her deputy director, and I'm really looking forward to supporting them as they throw another great conference. Yeah, the, the best thing about McMullen is it takes place in, in, in usually in the fall and in, in around September, uh, I believe, or time frame, and, and NASO takes place in the spring in May. So, you know, you, you can go to NASO in May, be there down in Pensacola, you can get your paper, you know, uh, presented down there, and then, you know, wrap it up and take it up to uh, uh, McMullen for, for, for the spring. Uh, if, I mean, for the fall, if, if, I have a, if I have one criticism of, of McMullen is there's so many panels going on, you just don't get a chance to see everything. But uh, for if you are a naval maritime historian, it, it is it is it is Disneyland. I'm telling you, you need to go if you haven't been able to get to one. Go there, international. There's always a topic. I one of my favorite things to do is to sit in a, a panel that I would typically not sit in. You know, something I don't know. I'm going to go learn something. I'm going to go sit in, listen to three pa papers, talk about 
you know, middle ages, uh, uh, galley warfare or something like that. And it's just, and it's fantastic. And it's top, top notch. You're on the Naval Academy grounds. You're in downtown Annapolis at night. It's, it's fantastic. So I just want to compliment you on that BJ. So I want to thank our guest BJ Armstrong for joining us for our NASO video podcast. We'll have links to BJ's works in the show notes. Be sure to check it out. Uh, if you liked our video and podcast, be sure to click like on YouTube or give it five stars on your podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel. We'll receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians. You can follow NASO on Facebook or on Twitter at NASO underscore history. The best way to follow NASO is to become a member. As such, you receive our newsletter, our quarterly journal, Northern Mariner, which we publish with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. Go to www.naso.org and click on membership to join. Until our next talk, keep sailing.